Funding for Start the Beat is provided in part by our supporters on Patreon. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Start the Beat with Sykes. My name is Sykes and this is my podcast. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank everyone who checked out the last episode. If you're one of those people, I hope you enjoyed the conversation and thanks so much for coming back. But for everyone out there who's new to the show, welcome. Feel free to make yourselves at home. And as always, there's beer, soda, water, coffee, tea, kombucha, whatever the fuck you like in the fridge. Cheers, my friend. Yes. I am sitting here today with my friend who I have been talking to already for the past 10 minutes, but I forgot to start recording the episode. I will put myself on blast, but fuck it. Hey, you know, nobody's perfect. So if you're out there today and you're beating yourself up for messing something up, it's okay. We all make mistakes, but I'm sitting here today with my friend, the one and only Endless Mike. Make some noise for the internet. (laughs) The people of the internet are happy that you're here. I'm happy that you're here. Thanks for being here. Well, I'm happy I'm here. I already know that you're having an all right day. And we've been talking about a little bit of the history of you growing up in the Johnstown music scene, DIY music community, blossoming, growing in like this time when, you know, people were young and excited about music and going to shows pre-social media i would imagine or like you know oh yeah maybe maybe yeah. like aim instant messenger if you know like teetering yeah. into that 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 realm of sort of things but uh you know we'll get back into all of that because i'm always interested in you know people's stories growing up in the music scene especially people that are still doing this at some capacity because for whatever ding dong reason you're still doing this like myself we're still into it it's in our blood our dna and uh you have a project coming out so we should definitely let people know about this new project that's coming out this split release take it away let the people know yeah awkward aardvark records here in pittsburgh is putting out a 10 inch uh record and it's with us We have one song on it, and the Homeless Gospel Choir. They're an alum of your show, right? He's been on the show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Derek's been on two or three times. Yeah. Um, And Mikey Erg has songs short enough that he gets two songs. (laughs) And then uh, Joe Jack Talcum from the Dead Milkmen has a song on it as well. And that split is a benefit for Pittsburgh uh, Center for Autistic Advocacy because Awkward Aardvark's a nonprofit label. And they give all the money that they make from it to a charity of the artist's choice. And uh, that's who we picked. Super cool. So, you know, working on something now, this was recorded in the, the, the quarantine, the pandemic, you know, you've gone through different variations of the band, you know, from 16 to one member. As we were talking about a little bit earlier. And uh, this recording has three people on it, right? Yeah, yeah, it's mostly me, uh, and then Davis plays. He, he he added a little bit of the drums to it, and he did, then he mixed it, and then he also got Kate's. Re- uh, he recorded Kate singing on it. Cool, which is really important to me because Kate's favorite band of all time is the Dead Milkmen, so she gets to be on a record with with Joe Jack Talcum. That's why. Yeah, no, like, you got to get Kate on it though. That's fucking awesome. I think it's so cool to be able to like you know have an opportunity to do something like that. I mean, just working with people in general, like doing split releases is a lot of fun and collaborating with people and doing something for a charity is fucking great. There's just like no downside to this. And I honestly, and some sort of a way I imagine I just answered the next question I'm about to ask you. And that question that I kind of already alluded to a few moments ago was why are you still doing this after all of these years through all of the bullshit? Why do we still do this? And I imagine maybe some part of it is because you get cool little opportunities to do things like this split. Yeah, that's definitely part of it. I guess the biggest reason is just to keep writing. I really like writing. I'm always, that's always in my head. So, you know, I don't know what it would be like if I didn't do that. And then if you write a song, you might as well show it to your friends, you know? Yeah. You might as well show it to your band. And then if you show it to your band, you might as well record it. And then if you have a recording, you might as well play some shows so that people can hear the record. Uh-huh. 
Now, it all, for me, it all starts with writing. How about with you? Why do you still do it? Uh, I just have an obsession, I think, with creating. That's yeah. really it. And yeah, all the other stuff is kind of aside. Uh, I love yeah. working on music. I love working on music with my friends and just putting new things together, learning, challenging myself, uh, doing things that impress myself is always cool. It makes me feel like, oh, wow, you're not such a fuck up. Look at what you're capable of, dude. Yeah. It's great. It's nice. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, it's fun. You know, I think that what I was going to ask is that, you know, growing up when you're younger, you know, and you're just kind of finding yourself and figuring out what you want to do. Did you have that same sort of a feeling? Did you feel like I just fucking love writing and I need to do it? Because that's how I felt when I was a kid. It wasn't like, oh, I just want to be in a band and this is going to be cool. And then over the years, I fell in love with writing. It was always like from day one, like I just want to make music. Yeah, it was it was definitely always me and my brother, Matt. It was like we want to write like we want to write our own songs. We want to be in a band. And, and play our songs, you know, we want to write songs. That's always what it was. When you were like first finding music, what was some of the music that really like knocked you on your ass? I know that you had mentioned uh, earlier before we were recording that like you were really into like Smashing Pumpkins, Siamese Dream and yeah. Weezer and, you know, I guess just kind of like mid 90s alt rock was probably yeah. a big thing for you then pixies big thing for me. yeah 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 so was that some of this first stuff that you had heard that was like wow like i fucking want to pick up a guitar and just fucking do this yeah yeah it would have had to have been sure my friend justin simba he uh he he stole a guitar player magazine or one of those you know that had the tablatures for about a girl by nirvana <laughs> and i had a and I had an acoustic guitar that my grandmother bought for me. And she bought Matt one too. These little beginner acoustic guitars. Like a couple of years prior, well, neither one of us had any interest in, in music really. Like I never really cared about, and this is now I do, but at the time, like the music that my parents liked or the music that was on the, the radio, like none of it, I, it wasn't like I didn't like it. It was like, it just was nothing to me. Yeah. And then all at once, all at once, like I, you know, I don't even remember who it was that I would have heard first. It was, I think it was Pearl Jam. You know, I was like, this is cool because my neighbor liked Pearl Jam. This is cool. And then he would bring stuff over and he listened to this Stone Temple Pilots and Tool. So he liked like heavier stuff, but it was, you know, that kind of old stuff too. Yeah. I'm and um, yeah, so Simba, he, he, and then I got into Nirvana and said, yeah, Simba stole that magazine and then I stole from him and then I learned how to play about a girl. <laughs> It was the first song I ever learned how to play. And that was uh it, that was it from there, just kind of on the journey. How old were you at that point? I was 17, 16 or 17. Nice, nice. Yeah. So that's kind of that's interesting. So that's a an interesting time, you know, to just start getting into music, but it's not entirely uncommon. So, right. you know, around that time, if you're 16, 17, around that era you know mid 90s or whatever you know uh i'm trying to think like what was happening before then i guess that would have been like what like you know the hair metal stuff right like or what was big and then or like like either like cnc music factory or like poison right. was like what you were gonna listen to there was yeah. no like alternative rock really at least like on a mainstream level right right so you know what was the stuff that your parents were listening to then the Beatles mm. and I love the Beatles now, you know, and I, I guess I thought they were, it was pleasant at the time, you know what I mean? But nothing connected to me until, until I started to hear, I think the Smashing Pumpkins was the first band. Siamese Stream was the first record that like made me feel something and think that maybe there was something more going on. Yeah. With music than just that it sounds cool. You know, you know what's cool um, about, that album in particular Siamese dream just like thinking about it in my head is there something like that's like i so the first time i heard i'm a little bit younger than you so the first time i heard Siamese dream i probably would have been like nine or ten but i definitely remember hearing it when it came out because my dad was into all that shit and um there's something that's like very like it feels like a journey of growing up in a sort of a way like the way that that music uh 
I don't know, just the sound of it. Like maybe it's just me attaching my nostalgia to it in some way, but I feel like being in that age, like 16, 17, 18, like you're going through so much change and this, the way that you are like from like 10, 11, 12, or like you're really starting to get a grasp on the world around you. And, uh, that music really like helped perfectly like told the story for me in that time frame because the smashing pumpkins were my favorite band at the time when that album came out like yeah. i you know i had i had the white shirt with the big red heart on it i saw nice. him at the civic arena that was actually my f- one of my first concerts ever was smashing pumpkins at the civic arena with Fonz and wayne opening. yeah 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 i was at that show nice nice yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that was rad i actually still dude i still to this day i remember that there was like like it had like just rained or something and there was like this smell in the air like that smell of rain and it was every time i smell that i i remember standing outside of the civic arena waiting to get into that show oh, to, you know i gotta correct myself i saw them at the bryce jordan center okay same tour okay it was in it was indoors but it was good too good show too yeah well i mean yeah the civic arena show it was still indoors but i just remember being outside like with my dad and my friend i'm yeah. pretty sure i was with my dad i don't remember and he was we're, we're spiraling i just I, I love that album and yeah. what i wanted to ask to get this back to you is you know okay so you you don't really get into music until those teenage years but did you have any sort of a creative outlet or interest in anything creative art or blah, i can't talk or artistic prior to picking up that guitar? Um, yeah, I love to draw and I loved to build with Legos. <laughs> okay. And I was, I like being in like class plays and stuff like that. So yeah, I guess so. So there is like, you know, uh, an artistic background, a performing arts background, all of that stuff was sort of already in your DNA to some degree, but just music hadn't really hit you yet. Yeah, I won a little poetry contest for the library one year. That was cool. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So I was probably like 10, 9 okay. or 10. Okay. So one of the things that I always, you know, find interesting and common amongst a lot of musicians is that they tend to be uh they come from this like introverted background, but I'm not kind of getting that vibe from you. Did you were did you were you much of an introvert through school or with these like activities that we're doing where you're just kind of like somewhere in the middle, maybe not like an extrovert, like party animal, look at me, but like you were around and doing things is the vibe I'm getting. Um, until I was in, like, I didn't honestly have, like there were a couple kids that I'd hang out with and stuff like that. I like being around, but then I got to have friends at like real friends. I made real friends around the same time that I was getting into music and that we all were. Um, and probably around that, that was a big part of it was being friends around music, you know, and, um, ever, and from that moment on, it was like, they were the only people I cared about. And I couldn't tell you much about the rest of the, like, I was friendly. I liked the other people that I went to school with. Sure. You know, whatever. But I just had this core group of friends that was so important to me that it, it, it was like nothing else could touch me, you know? Totally. Um, so I, although I didn't, we really stuck to ourselves, I guess I wasn't an introvert. I, I just remember feeling, looking back on it anyway, that like, it was just so great to have these guys, to have these, these people that were my friends, because then I didn't really care what anybody else thought. So then I was able to talk to other people and I was not, you know, bothered by it one way or the other, yeah. whether I was a, an introvert or not. Yeah, I think that I wasn't ever really an introvert or an extra. I was in this gray area as well, too, until I found friends when I was like, you know, 14 or 15. And we started taking the bus to the mall and that 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 kind of dumb shit like that was really yeah. it. That yeah. that was really it. And I'm, I'm thinking now that just recently I was having this conversation with my wife, Laura, and she was like. Explain to me that actually the, the term doesn't just mean that, like you are like how other people perceive you. But if you're an introvert, then you regenerate, like you recharge yourself while you're, you know, alone activities by yourself. And if you're an extrovert, you're more recharged by being around people. Oh, and, and, and so I guess in that case, I'm a, oh. and, and under that definition, I'm an extrovert. Okay. Okay. But I don't know. There are times too, when I got to just like, so I don't know. 
don't know. I guess there's degrees of it, right? Well, uh, yin and yang, right? Yeah. If, if you if you want to if you want to get into that sort of a philosophy, yeah. Growing up and you know getting out of high school and being involved in this DIY scene, I imagine at the time by by the time you had graduated, you were probably in it, right? Yeah. It was it was okay. happening. So yeah. you know what was life post high school like for you? being somebody involved in a DIY community and like who I imagine was probably really wrapped up in it. You know, did you do school? Did you do music full time? What was like the goal at that time? Like what was endless Mike going to be when he was 18? I did go to school. I went to Clarion, but I only went for a year and then I dropped out and I moved back to Johnstown and I never really left it anyway. Yeah. You know, we kind of come home on the weekends to punk shows, really. In <laughs> I wanted to be in a band. I wanted to make it like a full time thing, the band that I was in at the time. And, uh, but those guys were in college, you know, so it was, it just slowly kind of deteriorated, started another one, same thing, you know. I, so, but I don't know that I ever really had the plan to like, I didn't want to be like a rock star or make it. I, I didn't think about it any further than like, man, I really just want to like, I would love to go on tour. You know, I would love to play shows out of town and I would love it if people heard what we were doing. And I never really thought about it any further than that. Totally. It's a, it's a very interesting time i feel like for a lot of people that are in any sort of like a creative community you know whenever high school ends and then people start moving off to different schools or moving to different cities and all of this thing and all of a sudden like this friend group that you had just kind of it splinters and like yeah. you know it's not necessarily in like a bad way and it's like a beautiful right. thing you know when your friends are going and doing things that they they love and they're pursuing oh, shit. yeah but uh, yeah. it always leaves you, at least like for me, I was like, because I didn't go anywhere. Like I stayed where I was for the most part. And it was like, shit, like, what am I going to do now? Like all these, this music stuff I was doing with these people, it's like non-existent now. And then it was like, I just have to kind of like, it's like starting all over again and learning how to like make friends again in this weird way. Like going to shows and talking to strangers and things like that. Like it was... I guess I was kind of introverted in that way that it was easy for me to like be around people that would approach me. And like when you're in like a high school situation, like there's like a limited amount of people to hang out with. So it's a lot easier to kind of like find the cool table or, you know, tell somebody they have a cool smashing pumpkin shirt. And now you have a friend, but like yeah. at a show, like it gets a little bit weirder as you get older and it doesn't get any less weird. You know, now I'm in my thirties and it's like the idea of making friends is like a nightmare to me. But like, uh, you know, what was it like? Just like, you know, go like, how did you move forward from there? Because you're still making music. Was it just like, well, I guess I'm going to make solo music and then just find people. Or did you um, have other bands? Or did I what? Or did you have other bands prior to like the endless mic sort of era of things? Or yeah, you yeah, yeah. I was in a couple. I was in like two bands probably before this one. And then the, the second one. I started writing songs that would turn into Beagle Club songs um, before that second band ended. But I, uh, my friend asked me if I would play a show, and he was like, I hear you've been writing these like solo songs. You should, you should play a show. I'm throwing a show, and you should play it. My buddy Sean Jackson. And I was like, sure, I'll do it. That's cool. And then after I committed to doing it, he was like, well, it's like a solo. Sh it's like an all acoustic show, by the way. And I was like, ah, oh, that's whack. I don't want to do that. So, so then I asked all my other friends that were in other bands, if they would learn these couple songs that I had to play with me. And I think there were like, you know, six of us then. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll just play some, I'll play a tambourine, you know, or the other guy like, okay, I'll play this piano. I'll make something up on this. And uh, that's how it's been ever since was that, well, that's how it started to be, you know, ever since that and and it, it's it's kept that version of where like whoever can be a part of it cool for the night and whoever can't cool and it, it's somewhere it made this shift between being like a solo project where it was like it's my band and my friends they they come in and play you know but i don't really have a band to it being 
a band where like, well, even if you're not here tonight, you're still in the band. You know what I mean? We'll yeah. just do it. So there, you know, and as you said, there was at probably at the height of it, like 16 people playing. That's funny. Man, there's not that many now. Everybody's even more spread out. Uh-huh. That's a bummer. A lot of these guys I haven't really talked to as much as I want to be. And uh, even through this, I think that, you know, the, 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 nobody got closer with the, the lockdown stuff. It wasn't like anybody like reached out to each other. You know what I mean? Because I don't, maybe it was too painful. Maybe it was something, but I don't, do you feel like, I, I remember there being like these optimist think pieces at the time when the pandemic started that like, well, maybe we'll figure out what's really important again. You know, maybe we'll reconnect and life won't be so fast paced and blah, blah, blah. And I don't, I don't think any of that happened. I mean, you know, I, I would say um, about a month or so in, I like started uh, messaging friends and just kind of like, hey, was thinking about you, thought I'd say hi. But like, I can't do that more than once. I, I think it's kind of like <laughs> weird to keep doing that. Um, yeah. Maybe it's not. Maybe maybe I'm just being silly, uh, but... You know, it was just like I kind of checked in with everybody and also now like with the Internet and Facebook and Instagram and shit like I'm I'm on it and I I see what my friends are doing. Like I know what everybody's up to. And for the most part, it seems like most of the people that I'm around are they're figuring it out. Um, I think that, you know, if (laughs) you needed a pandemic to really, you know, reassess your life and figure out what was important chances are you weren't going to figure it out anyways not not to be (laughs) cold i I don't i don't mean to be cold but i feel like most people that are going to figure it out like we're already going to figure it out regardless you know what i mean it's kind of like the you know it's a new year and there are people that are all into like their new year's resolutions and things like that like i've never been that type of person if you are like that's good for you but for me it's like I'm not going to wait until a new year to start something that I think is a good idea. If I think something's a good idea, I'm going to start now. I don't need it to be January or for it to be a pandemic for me to like turn my life around. Right. So, but that's just me. Um, Yeah. But it should have, you know, I think as a, as a, I'm just, I just mean like as a whole, you know, why couldn't this big slap in the face of made people, you know, uh, society, if you will, it couldn't have made things wake up a little better. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just feeling particularly weird about it at I, the moment. But uh, I wish that it would have, I don't know, changed some things for the better. I don't think it did. Well, you, you've, been, you've been alive on this spinning rock in the universe long enough to probably have noticed that most people are unapologetically and unforgivably selfish and it's kind of Dude, just <laughs> i honestly like mourned like went through grieving i think for my faith in other people's uh, other people sure uh, not and, and, like since about uh, roughly 2016 you know sure i think before that i thought that i was i was like I tried to see the best and I still do individually, you know, but, but I thought it just, it just, it, I've, it's these past couple of years have really shaken my uh, big picture thinking about things. And that's a bummer, but maybe sure. it's time to be a little, like, it was probably a little naive in the first place. It well, turns out. And that yeah. sucks. And that's what I mean. This pandemic couldn't make people, Oh, you know what? We've really gone off the rails here. You know, nah, there was none of that. None of that. Yeah. I I think, you know, it's so easy to get wrapped up in yourself and what's going on and, you know, with all of our, you know, terror boxes, as I like to call them, uh, they, they, it pumps out to you whatever you interact with. And most people interact with things that frighten them for whatever reason, whether they mean to or not, they engage with it. Then the next thing you know, everything that you're seeing on your phone in your news it's not even just on facebook or on instagram you could be on an on a news site or just like looking at a goddamn guitar and there's like a, a news ad that pops up because like they have all the targeted ads through everything so it's sure. like they know like you're somebody that interacts with like this or that type of media all of a sudden it's just in front of you all the fucking time because you clicked one article two weeks ago it's i don't know there's a lot 
there's a lot of bad, but I'm not smart enough to understand why any of this stuff works. I could be completely wrong. I'm just going off of things that I've noticed and observed. And it just seems like uh, having a lot more time to spend in the terror box hasn't done anyone any favors. Nope. And uh, that's why... There's no going back. There's no, no going No, 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 no. I think that it's just... Uh, and you can't really tell people that what they're doing is unhealthy. Um, like mm. being on a phone, like you can't tell somebody that because right. it's, it, it's just, they, it's just something that they kind of have to figure out on their own and decide like what they're going to do for themselves. It's just, uh, I don't know. I, I, pff, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I do. I, you know, I just work on my, my selfishness kicks in much as like other people's selfishness kicks in. But my form of selfishness is like, I'm going to record podcasts and do little vlogs and make art and try to put things out into the internet. So if people want to follow me and like, they can listen to a conversation with some cool people about some cool things and they don't have to hear about the terrors of the world for an hour. That's my contribution. Yeah. But you know, it still creeps its way in because it's, it's fucking unavoidable, man. It's yeah. really unavoidable. Yeah. I think yours and mine, our generation is probably the last generation where it wasn't totally weird to have grown up in a house without a computer in it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't. And that's not to say that there aren't homes now where people do, um, but it's that would be really strange, right? I think kids would think, you don't have a computer, you know? You know there's, you, oh, you wanna, your parents no. don't have a the internet, you know what I mean? Yeah. But when you and me were kids, it wasn't unheard of. It was probably about. It wasn't. It also wasn't like this cool, you know, novelty kind of thing to have it. But I bet ours was the last generation where. Probably, you know, probably. I don't think I lived in a house with a Wi-Fi connection until I was maybe twenty-three or twenty-four years old. Sure. Um, and that was, you know, that that's wild. You know, considering now, you know, most. I think I think iPads have completely re- replaced the concept of a babysitter in most situations. So it's like, you know, I don't know how a lot of parents can even survive without having Wi-Fi in the home. And I didn't have Wi-Fi in my house until I was in my 20s. But yeah. um, I don't know. I think that even with the Internet, there's like I think that like people that are I would say people that are like 16, 17 years old now. I think they probably interact with the internet in a much healthier way than that generation that was in between us and them. Like, I think like a lot of people that are in their mid twenties now, I think that that's like the generation that had like the worst of the internet. Um, Just from my observations, because like when I have younger kids on the podcast, cause I've had like 17, 18, 19 year old rappers and shit like that and like they use social media but it's not like a huge thing they're like i don't have a facebook i don't have an instagram we have like a tiktok or a snapchat it's whatever i just like you know tell friends we have our little private messaging apps and like that's how i promote my shows is through those and like i don't really use these social media things i mean there are people on it but there are a lot of people that are just like that's for old people yeah and it's kind of like weird you know, they're like, there's like this weird generation of like those mid 20 okay. somethings where it's like, they feel like they need to have like every single social media app in the world. And they're like yeah. spreading themselves way too thin. Well, good. Maybe they'll, maybe it'll die out with us. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. I think that it, it's, it's not to be too doomy and gloomy, but for the most part, going back to what we were talking about in terms of like losing faith in and people and realizing how selfish people can be over the past couple of years. Um, I, I think I'm in the same boat with you in terms of just like losing that, that saying that you lose faith in humanity is very dramatic because I don't think I've lost faith in humanity. It's just like, on, I, I just think that human beings uh, somewhere in our, our DNA, there's this like survival of the fittest mentality that kicks in with us. Mm-hmm. That's like this primal instinct to just kind of like, you know, take care of your, your, you and your, your inner circle. And there are just, uh, some people and some demographics of the country and the world where that, that kicks in a lot more. You know, I think it's a lot different maybe growing up in a small town where, you know, you have, you know, four neighbors in a 10 mile radius and like, you know, 
you're all, you know, into Trump versus being like somebody that lives in a city that, you know, went to high school with 300 kids from all different backgrounds and you were exposed to all of these different things. You know, I remember I like had somebody on the podcast once that grew up. I forget where they grew up, but they went to Pittsburgh here at Point Park and they had never met a black person until they went to Point Park. Yeah. Which is like insane. And like, you know, talking with them about just like their background and like growing up in this rural area and just like not having negative or bad feelings towards like people of color or whatever, but just never, they just were never around it. And like the crazy thing is like, you know, you've been around the country. I imagine the majority of America is rural America. It's not these big cities. So that's that's kind of like why whenever you think about like, oh, like why did 2016 happened. It's like, well, I don't know if you've ever been around the country. It kind of makes sense in a lot of ways. Not everywhere is like these cool melting pots of communities and people and kids and families getting to know each other and getting to like try all these different kinds of food and meet different people and be exposed to different music and art and all this stuff. Most of America Mm -hmm. just really isn't like that. No, no, I agree. So I don't know. I don't want to be empathetic towards like ignorant or like mean people, but there is like some sort of like an understanding that I try to have in terms of just like, well, a lot of people come from just like very, very small backgrounds. Yeah, that's true. So I don't know. And I feel like most people don't mean to be feel like most people don't mean to be terrible people, but that doesn't mean that you're still not terrible. I don't know. Anyways, speaking of growing up, (laughs) getting back to you, right? So You're in the DIY community in high school, right? Yeah. And, you know, the DIY community, punk community of that sort, uh, it can, it can have its characters. It can have its people. It can have its not so great of people. Some, you know, some unsavory types from here and there. And I'm curious, you know, as you were growing up and starting to get into this point of like, well, I need to maybe abandon some of these aspects of the DIY life if I'm going to become an adult. Did you ever have that sort of a conversation with yourself or were you always more towards like the, the reserved kind of like more responsible side of being involved in the community? Yeah, it it wasn't the scene in Johnstown wasn't one of like, there wasn't a lot lot of drugs or there was no drugs, no drinking at the shows because we, there was all rented uh, community spaces anybody got caught we were all going down you know and there weren't going to be any more shows at that place so it was pretty strictly it didn't have to be strictly enforced actually it was just widely understood not to do it you know yeah and if somebody did show up with a six-pack it wasn't like a bunch of kids with x's on their hands would surround them and beat them down about it it was more just like dude if you if we get caught without that there's not gonna be any more shows and then oh okay and then mostly leave you know or Put in their car till the show was over. So it was never really a big part of my experience in the DIY scene, that unsavory kind of stuff. That's the first thing that comes to mind. But um, no, I don't know. I feel like maybe, you know, I'd like to think that I brought the positive stuff of it with me in to this day. Yeah. I mean, you, you seem like a, a, a well-adjusted, well-adjusted, well-adjusted positive force for yourself and the people around you, I imagine, which is nice. It's good to see that. I think that, you know, it's, I've recently been trying to like, I've had these conversations with myself where, you know, like you're, I'm, I'm 35 and that's not old by any means, but like, you know, am I like, how long am I going to just hang out at band practice and drink? Like, how much longer is this going to happen? Like, it's cool. There's no reason for it not to. I've put myself into a position where it's like, you know, I take care of myself and the people around me and I can afford to do this. It's my time. Why not? Why not? Why not fucking do it? But still, it's like, is there more? Should I have done something else with my life? I don't know. I just have these dumb questions from time to time. But like, what the fuck would I have done? There is not more. I don't think. <laughs> do, do do you ever did you do you ever like not necessarily beat yourself up but like just ask yourself those sorts of questions or is that just like am I just a dumbass? Should I just stop doing that? Oh no, I've definitely you definitely think. <laughs> I just yesterday to 
to Laura, we were talking. She was like, well, uh, you know, we're, can you could we were talking about uh, it doesn't that my job, you know, on the vacation. No, I just told you I'm on vacation, right? Yeah, it's the first vacation I've from I've taken since uh, since I started this new job in in like June. And uh, so I'm off all week, you know, and she was like, man, you get all this vacation time. You should, you could go on like a six week, you know, a six week tour, you know, next. If you saved it up and used it all at once. And I was like, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm too old. I'm not, I don't have many years of that left. <laughs> you know, I'm too old to be doing that. She yeah. was like, whatever. Dylan's 78, you know, and I was like, people come to see Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you, you know, finally... So you mentioned before that all you wanted to do was go on tour when you were starting yeah. and play shows for people. So eventually you got to a point where you could do that. You got to go play some shows for people. Yep. So, you know, what was that experience like and what got you to the point now of just kind of being like, you know what? I don't think I want to put that much more time into doing this. Like where was the point A to point B of that for you? Oh, I mean, it, it was, I say this all the time, but when I think back to the first tour that we ever did, I cannot believe we ever did a second one. <laughs> and I think of that second one and I cannot believe that we ever did a third one. Uh huh. And then I think of the third one and it was great, you know? Okay. Uh, it was amazing. And then they were all always good. They were all always good. And the, but then it just sort of started to slow down, you know, um, I think for a good three years. So I've been putting out records and writing songs in one form of this band or another for a long time now, like 15 years, maybe. Um, and but it's it's really there was a three year period there where it was really, really like a full force kind of thing. And then after that, it was just kind of like come and go, you know, a couple tours a year, you know, get together, play a couple shows. But for those three years there, man, it was the most important thing in the world. And uh, we played constantly. And those three years, they were great. Those tours were all great. And then, I don't know, people just started to needed to slow down a little bit and we needed to um, do other things. The guys in the band started other bands and People started moving away and people, you know, just got a little bit older, got a little bit less willing to suffer like that. You mm -hmm. know, I can't believe those first couple of tours, <laughs> but uh, I loved the rest of them. And, and I've like the last tour I was on and they, it was like a solo tour, but it was still like the best tour I ever did. It was the most, it wasn't the most fun because my friends weren't all there. But it was like the best, you know what I mean? Most successful or whatever tour that I've ever done. So it's still it's still an option. I think I was just like you said, you know, having those thoughts of like, can't still be playing, you know, DIY spaces when you're 40. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I think that's what I meant when I said that to Laura. Yeah, it, dude, I still do want to go on tour. Yeah, it, it's 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 I remember uh, a, a few years ago uh, I played what is probably we'll see most likely probably my last basement show ever. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it depends on the crowd that's going to be there. If it was a basement show with like, you know, like minded and like aged individuals, I'd probably be into it, but it's yeah. like, you know, I'm 31 in a basement and I'm pretty sure that person holding that bottle of wine is probably 17 or 18 years old. And like, I'm glad that you have this. I came from this and like I met some of the best people in my life through this community and I'm glad that it still exists. I'm not saying that I'm glad there's an underage kid drinking. I'm just glad that the community's here. Um, but it's maybe not my time to maybe leave and let other people start yeah. playing these shows. It's just not, yeah. it's not for me yeah. anymore. And, right. uh, but you know, there's that, it's like battling that that sort of thing, that energy, you know, back when I was 25 and it was like, I'll just play any fucking show anywhere, anytime. I don't give a shit. And like that, that like I'm still that person, but I know that I just like logistically can't be that person, even if I yeah. want to be. It's just it's not I can't do it. 
Oh yeah. I mean, I remember the, yeah, that it was like you have a show and you're like, just can't think about anything else. You, if you do anything to get there, you know, drive through feet of, you know, the feet of snow, we would do that kind of stuff, you know, when we were first starting, but there is absolutely such a thing as a show not worth. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's funny now because like, you know, and I think everybody should know that have the kind of self, have that oh, yeah. self respect to know that there's such a thing as a show not worth being at. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I think that, uh, in, in, okay. So this is what I'm going to say in regards to a, a world that is post pandemic when we can start playing some gigs again. Right. If there's one reflection or one thing that anybody in the music community learned that I hope they've learned, I hope that it's that they realize that it's totally fine to play one show in your town like once every other every other two months. You don't have to play every weekend and it'll be totally fine. And then right. maybe people will actually, to some degree, they might be more interested in coming out to shows if it's not the same goddamn show happening every other week or every other, you know, it's, it's I think that's kind of the big hang up is like these bands get their friends and then they just do the same show at the same venue every month and that's the thing it's the hangout for everybody which is cool and i guess if you're not really interested in building a community and you just kind of want to hang out with your friends that's fine but my my advice would be just go hang out with everybody and leave the instruments at home yeah you know just put the ramones on the jukebox and have a good time like you know everybody would probably rather hear that than listen to your same set you've been playing for the past five years again guaranteed <laughs> so but i don't know maybe that's my my cynical old age kicking in again i don't know i just hope that whenever things come back there's like a a healthier sort of like dispersion of local entertainment and people can maybe be a little bit more reserved and more choosy about what they do and think about why they're doing what they're doing i don't yeah. know that's a whole nother fucking can of worms though well, John, you know, Johnstown only an hour and a half away. Pittsburgh was always like, you know, I mean, we it was like playing a local show, you know what I mean? Even though it was an hour and a half to drive, but it was like we would we would play shows in Pittsburgh often. You were it wasn't you weren't on tour, you know what I mean? Yeah. When you'd play when you'd play Pittsburgh, it felt like it was just like oh yeah, it's a Pittsburgh show. But um, that said, I was never really a, a part of the the Pittsburgh scene, other than like getting to meet the bands that we played with and stuff. So, and we moved here in, we moved to Pittsburgh in like June. So everything's been closed. You know what I mean? I'm excited just to see a, a, a scene and maybe try to be a part of it. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, I I'm definitely uh, looking forward to whatever coming back. I'm definitely, yeah. I, I definitely, uh, I, I, I'm tired of, spending all my time on the internet. I would like for you to be sitting right next to me right here yeah. in instead of I want to be in the, the room with the bricks. That room is gone. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with the funny funny story, I was actually planning on moving out of that room anyways cuz I wanted to get a space where I could also have bands perform and be on the show. Yeah. And I couldn't do it at that space, but then Right pandemic happened and i was like well i moved everything here so now all my gear is in my house and i have yet to decide what the next move is because it's still things are up in the air yeah i have no idea with yourself and growing up in this in this music scene still doing it what else, if anything, have you discovered? Maybe you'll say in the past decade, have you found any new interests or hobbies or things outside of music that have helped keep, keep your interest in just being a part of humanity afloat? Well, yeah. I mean, in the past decade, my oldest boy is 10 years old. Wow. His little brothers and his little brother seven. So that's been quite the outside interest wow, for the okay. last 10 years. Yeah. Okay. What what are what are the kids into? Uh, they're, they're, they're they bounce around quite a bit, you know. So into what they're into, Jack especially is into. Uh, though he draws his own comic books, 
and he he's really good at drawing and he's learning to play the violin and he likes basketball and soccer. That's and awesome. Robots, so, <laughs> you know, build, building robots and stuff like that. Yeah. We were just talking about this a little bit ago in terms of like uh, youth and people growing up with technology around them. So I, mm -hmm. I wasn't aware that you had two children at the time of saying that. So mm -hmm. you have firsthand experience then of just seeing how like kids interact with technology and maybe how their friends interact with technology and things like that. Yeah. And, like, what have you noticed just as well, a, it, this has only been like, we really tried to kind of, we very much limited the letting Jack you know, he was my friends and my cousins, you know, they have like a Snapchat. Can I get a Snapchat? And we're like, nope. Okay. <laughs> He's like, I want to make a thing on YouTube. Nope. You know, but we've, we've really loosened up on, on kind of some of the, or he would want to play, you know, these online games where the, there were chat rooms and stuff. In oh them, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. We're just like, nope, 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 nope. But we've kind of loosened up because his buddies, let him do that kind of stuff and because he wasn't going to see them otherwise or yeah. his cousins you know even though you know it's we still kind of try to watch it but i trust him with it he's doing all right um and then jude he really likes to just watch youtube videos so but he can like navigate it by himself and he knows where he is with it but we always watch him you try to limit those things you know because otherwise they would totally just do it all day long yeah it's it's hard because like i think that like you know, if you have a kid that is like uncontrollably curious, like I feel like I was a really uncontrollably, uncontrollably curious kid. And I like, if I would have had access to the internet to just be able to like look up whatever I wanted, it probably would have been pretty cool to like be able to like have that opportunity to dig into these things that I'm interested in. And like, yeah. you want to hope that you hope for the best that like, you know, if, you leave, you know, a kid alone with YouTube and if they're interested in things like maybe they're just looking at they're exploring their curiosities. Their brain is a sponge and they're absorbing cool, positive information because there's plenty of it on the Internet. The Internet's a yeah. fucking awesome thing, but it can also be oh, yeah. unbelievably horrifying. Right. <laughs> so yeah, it's my, like my thing is like, yeah, if, you know, let's say he was looking up. I want to look up this video about how to, you know, code because I'd like to make my own video game. So he gets on youtube to look up that that's awesome i want him to do that all day long but look at right underneath it the first comment is just the ugliest thing you've ever yeah, seen in your how, life yeah you know? like, how do you how do you manage that i don't know that's i guess you just have to i yeah. don't know i don't know i, just, I mean you know, I, I guess, he, yeah he's gonna have to they're both gonna have to figure it out yeah i mean that that There's i not gonna be a parental controls over real, real life you know yeah. But it's just such a, I don't know. Dude, it's yeah, funny. Know, it's kind of like, <laughs> you know, in a way, it's not too dissimilar from the concept of like having to grow up and kind of break away from this like DIY community in some regard. Like it gets to that yeah. point where it's like, oh, I, I can't play the basement show anymore. I have to understand that like I have grown past this yeah. and I, I need to move on. Like eventually your kids are going to get to a point where it's like they don't need to be observed anymore and like they're gonna be doing their own thing and just like letting go of that and just having to trust that you know they're making those good decisions for themselves it's that's horrifying so i think yeah. about the stuff that i was doing when i was like 15 16 years old and i mean it wasn't anything terrible but it also wasn't anything great so yeah. but it was fun <laughs> it was it sure was <laughs> Outside of this split that's coming out, um, do you have any other music or anything creative wise that you've been working on that you're planning on putting out into the world? Yeah, I've been I've been learning to through the pandemic, I've been learning how to record. You know, I got some equipment set up myself, a little studio, and I've been learning how to record and how to mix, and it's so much fun. It's so fun. I'm not very good at it. Stop, and like uh, I'll get, so I've gotten some good results, but I don't know how. <laughs> sure, uh, you know, so I'm not like, but I'm still learning it all the time, and it's super fun. So I've been doing that a lot, and I've probably written. A I mean, I've definitely written a ton of songs. I've probably recorded like ten, fifteen, you know, that I've 
either finished or started and I still got more that I wrote in my head. And that's what I'm really doing this week is buckling down and trying to knock out as many of these as, as I can. Yeah. I, it's a, it's a great time to pick up a new skill like that. And, you know, I always say for anyone that is a musician learning some aspect of how to self-record is so crucial especially in like modern internet times where like um if you want to play ball i would say you know if you want to be a musician that's releasing music and just kind of part of the game of putting out music you have Mm -hmm. to be consistent you have to be able to self-produce stuff because unless you have like an awesome team but most of us don't have teams of people or like you know, endless resources or people that will record us pro bono, like, you know, every day to demo out the stuff. So being able to at least have something to record yourself and get those ideas down is huge. It's huge. So that's awesome that you're, you're getting into that. And I think that it's fun too, because you can like really start to develop your own voice as an artist, because if you're somebody that has always just recorded um, with other producers and engineers and you've never recorded yourself like then you've never really heard a recording like a recorded version of what you actually sound like because you've always been filtered through somebody else's idea of how you should be presented it's like somebody else has been dressing you you know for the past you know few couple decades of your music career now for the first time like you have access to the closet and you get to pick out exactly what you want to wear it might not be the prettiest outfit but at least you picked it out yeah. And you can you can build that style. Well, aside from the last one, uh, every other record that we ever made, um, Davis, our drummer, recorded it. And oh, cool. It. So, and now that I'm learning to do this, I realize how awful demanding, like some of the dumb, the, the, <laughs> the things that I would expect of this poor man, uh, you know? Like, uh, dude, it's... But it's, um, I think that we always worked really close hit me, him and, and my brother, Matt, especially the three of us would always work really close on, on the records and what they, what they should say, you know, what we want them to sound like. And, and, um, but then when we did the one with, with Chris number two, it was, that was a little different because he just kind of, yeah, set us up and we went for it. And, um, he even sent it off to be, mixed you know he but he recorded it and so it was like this process that we were kind of removed from uh, if it had been that all along that would have been strange this was like a different uh, this was like adjusting the opposite kind of way you know? yeah yeah it was always being a hundred percent in control and then not being <laughs> yeah I, I i it's very similar to that concept or the saying, you know, that maybe like how sometimes people will say that everybody should have at some point in time in their life worked in the restaurant industry or in a way like maybe you shouldn't say anything bad about a waitress or somebody in customer service if you've never been in that position. I feel very similar to recording and engineering. I feel like most musicians should have at least tried to demo something themselves at some point in time before they go into a studio. If anything, just so they can understand that if they're actually working with the right engineer and so they can have that like understanding of how to tell an engineer or a producer what they want, because sometimes like, you know, somebody saying like, Oh, like I just want my, you know, I want my bass to be louder here, but it doesn't sound right. You know what? you know, maybe it's like, Oh, do you want like a compression thing or do you want this or that? Do you want me to side chain your EQ? Like, you know, and then like, you're like, what are you talking about? I don't know. I just want it to be louder versus if you actually demoed your stuff, you could be like, Hey, you know, can you adjust this in the, in the 4k range, please? And they're like, okay, sure. You know how nerdy you want to get, but it definitely helps. Communication is definitely key in those, in those scenarios. So right, I didn't, I I would, I remember uh, Matt especially gave really great notes, really great directions. It would be stuff like this was to Davis, you know, and he did it to Barker too, to Chris number two as well. We had a lot of fun recording with Chris. It was really cool. And he did a really good job. And um, Davis was like super like, yeah, go for it. He was like glad to be like out of the seat 
out of the driver's chair and and he was awesome with it you know but um matt would matt gives really great notes and stuff like that part should sound like a guy who's about to get shot out of a cannon <laughs> would be like okay but that was the difference because me and davis would be like oh yeah you're right you know mm-hmm. whereas when he'd say that to chris he'd be like you're gonna have to you're gonna have to give me a little more there <laughs> mm-hmm. i think that it's always awesome to record with somebody that understands your vision and uh is down to record and actually gives a fuck about your project um, yeah yeah for sure it, like we came to the uh the vision i think we came to with chris um kind of as we were doing it and that was really fun too yeah i think that if you don't have that that connection with the engineer it just like you get like a really really weird product in the end mm-hmm. and i've always you know i when i started making music i was making beats so i started making electronic music in a daw so basically yeah. me i started writing music and demoing like at the same time like learning how a daw works it was it was synonymous with me so yeah. it was funny uh, moving forward to like actually starting to playing in bands and being with groups of people that were just in a room working on songs in a space with like a dry erase board and like, you know, notes on different parts and how long, how many bars and things like that. And I'm just like, yeah. this isn't a computer. This is so weird for me because I was so used to the complete opposite, but it made it really hard in the future. Then whenever like it was time for those bands to like go into a studio and record, it was like really hard for me to like, trust other engineers or understand their process because i had like such a limited niche understanding of like how to record hip-hop which was essentially electronic music versus like recording a live band it's like a t- totally different things two different worlds yeah oh yeah 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 this is working on this stuff doing this and my little studio has been really cool because you know i'm playing all the parts and trying to write all the parts and so I think I've got a little better playing the piano, you know, because I play it all the time now, playing the keyboards. And yeah, it's super fun. Programming beats, writing beats. It's been great. It's really made the songs different, too, obviously. So yeah. I think when I finally put these out, if I do something with them, they're going to sound pretty different. No, I think that that's awesome. And I think that yeah. it's really, really cool, you know, as you move forward as an artist to be able to be in a place creatively where you can just do different things like, Oh, I want to make this album. That's like maybe like a little bit of piano, acoustic guitar and digital beats, but it's still me because I can do that. You know, like my death metal band can't do that. There's only, and then like, as it moves forward, it's like, well, how, how do we continue to push forward the creative and artistic forces of a death metal band? Like it's possible, but it's just like hard now. It's like, you know, and like just trying to, like, I'm always like wondering like, what am, what are we going to do moving forward? Like, how are we going to continue to challenge ourselves and keep this interesting? It's always like a big question versus like when I do my rap stuff, like that's never a question. I'm always like, there's always something weird I can throw in the pot and it'll make sense because I could do whatever I want. But why can't I have that mentality with the metal shit? I don't know. Maybe I'm just holding myself back. I don't know. But yeah, it always should be changing, right? You much of a metal fan? Not really. (laughs) If there's anything in your catalog of music that you love, that you would maybe think to be the most surprising to people that know you. Not necessarily a guilty pleasure, but something that maybe people wouldn't expect you to be into. What do you, do you have uh, anything? I don't know. Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. Probably yeah. Not. I can't think of anything. Yeah. I, I have, I've always had like a really wide variety of, music yeah. and shit that i listen right. to so it's not weird to me but uh it's funny sometimes. i certainly like i certainly love watching metal bands live do you know what i mean yeah like, I, lo- I like my, but i just i can't i wouldn't be able to hang talking about it or totally like that. totally it's funny sometimes whenever like uh people are over and like back when i was able to have people in my house and they would like look through my records and it's just like you know you have like 
Paramore, 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 Pig Destroyer, poured his head. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> it's like, hey, this is who I am. Yeah. I love all this stuff. You know, Absolutely. moving forward now into 2021, you, you have this release coming out. Again, what's the date on that split release? The 10th. The 10th of January. January 10th. Yep. January 10th. You get it. It's just an awkward aardvark. Yeah, that's the only, like, they're not doing a pre-order or anything. And I think, but I think, I know you can, you can order it from their site. So that's coming out. And it's then, coming out. then you have this collection of, you know, uh, DIY studio songs that maybe may or may not make it out into the ether at some point in time. I think they should. They will. <laughs> I think they should. They will. Yeah. And then, you know, in terms of there's a there's a music video that you had sent me that is for your song that's part of this collaboration. Is that going to be available online the tenth as well or prior? Um, or is it out, gonna, out now? Yeah, it's premier. It's the, it's going to be online uh, right around the same time. Okay, so people can check that out on YouTube.com, the website. If you've ever if you've ever heard of it, you're uh. Your kid could watch it on YouTube. What? Okay. That's right. I've, I've disabled the comments on the YouTube. <laughs> so my my final question to you now, uh, being a a, a a family a family a family man, a dad, what does like your family and your kids think of like the whole music thing? Is it like a a thing that you? make very well aware of or is it just kind of a thing like oh that's just a thing that dad does it's i th it's more like it's just the thing that dad does. <laughs> it's great in fact even today to even today this morning as he was getting ready to leave he was like well you, you know what are you doing today and i said i'm i'm doing a an interview uh you know at one o'clock and he was like an interview for what like to be on like a a podcast, like a, a you know an internet show, man. I'm gonna be on the internet, and he was like, for what? It's like, cause uh, you know, like the band, like to talk about the band stuff. And he was like, <laughs> <laughs> just like so, like yeah, it's whatever. Just what he, it's just who his parent, you know. It's just who his dad is. It's just who it's that's his family, you know. Even when I would go on tour and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's just what we do, you know, and his, his, his mom used to travel a lot more for work than she does now. Um, obviously, but even with the new job here in Pittsburgh, she doesn't have to travel as much, but she used to travel a lot for work and that was just mom. That's just how it is. You know, kids just, that's how families are. You know, if that's how your family is, that's just how your family is. It's pretty cool. It's yeah. a pretty great thing. Yeah, for it to be that way. I actually think that's pretty cool that they don't care. Yeah. Honestly, I, I, I kind of, it's 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 humbling and I think very uh crucial that the people that are the closest to you in your life like don't really hold much not necessarily that they don't hold value in what you do creatively, but it's like that's not why they're around. I think it's important for like people to just be around because they want to be around. Obviously, if it's your fucking kids and your wife, you would hope that they want to be around because they just want to be around. But outside of that, like I you know, I I, I always find it very refreshing and preferable if like I can see somebody that I haven't seen in a couple months and I don't have to talk about my band or something like that. And I could just, you know, talk about some cooking show that we watched on Netflix or whatever, yeah. just any, anything else, just because I spend all day like in my head working on projects and things like that. And if I'm like allowing myself to go out to like a bar or somewhere where you would see people, this is of course, Pre pandemic, but you know, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm out in public and I have a beer in my hand, I probably am not super interested in the moment and talking about work because I've already been working all day, but whatever. Sometimes people are just curious and they want to know. So you have to be nice to people. Yeah, you do. Yeah. I overanalyze everything. I don't know. Some people have told me that like drugs might help that, but I've never been a druggie. So I just kind of, I'm lost, I'm lost in the sauce you, with my feelings. It, it'll help. It'll help you not overanalyze. Yeah. You'll yeah. analyze less if you do more drugs. Yeah. Yeah. I don't believe them either. <laughs> 
think it's the other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't believe them either. I don't think it's going to help me at all. Well, <laughs> I appreciate that. Not that I was like, I, I'm, I'm well past the point of peer pressure at the, at this, at this stage in my life. Just say no. Fortunately, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's a, uh, it's even past just say no. At this point, my whole life is just say, eh. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's accurate. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. Nah. Well, with all of that being said, let's wrap this up. The train has come around the station. We've done a full rotation around the mountain that is the Start the Beat podcast. So I'm going to do my outro and I'm going to let you get going onto your day to work on some cool songs or to do absolutely nothing. I don't know what you're going to do, but whatever it is, I hope you do it well. And that is all, folks. Thanks so much for being here one more time. Mike, thank you. Thank you. I'll be back again next week with another episode. Same time, same place, same channel. You know the drill. My name is Sykes. Start the beat 2021. Woo, woo. Thanks for listening. And we are done. That is a podcast, my friend. We made it happen. All right.